Well, good morning. Uh, I'm George Latimer, Worcester County Executive, and I'm here with our Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins, and uh, State Senator-elect, Peter Harkham, uh, former Majority Leader of the Board of Legislators and recently elected to the New York State Senate. Peter, happy to have you here. Thank you, Happy to have you back Thank in you. county government. And uh, we're here to um, sign into law a bill that has been long discussed and, and quite the source of some controversy, and that controversy was ultimately acted on by the Board of Legislators, and so now it's uh, my opportunity to sign it into law. We're also joined by members of the Board of Legislators. The Vice Chair of the Board, Alfreda Williams, is with us, and she's one of the sponsors of this bill. Chris Johnson, legislator from Yonkers, a prime sponsor of the bill and strong spokesperson for the bill. Damon Marr, Westchester County legislator, is with us as well. Uh, am I missing any other legislators? David, David Tubiello from Yonkers is with us. Thank you, David. And if any other legislators join us, we'll make sure we introduce them. Um, we have uh, the uh, Chief of Staff of the Board of Legislators, Dennis Powers, with us uh, today, and some other members, both of the Executive Branch staff and of the Administrative staff. And we have leaders in both the realtor, realtor community and in the co-op management community with us here. Uh, and we're going to recognize them as well uh, before we end this conference so that uh, you see all of the players in the game that were critical in this process. Uh, we're going to have uh, State Senator-elect Tarkham speak, our Deputy County Executive Vice Chair Williams and Legislator Johnson will be at the podium and will be sharing some comments. When we're finished uh, with all the comments, I'll sign the bill into law, and then uh, we'll have uh, any questions from the press, and then if you want to interview anybody one-on-one, -on -one, feel free uh, after that point. Uh, this bill... Uh, the co-op disclosure bill has been in the works for over 20 years and uh, it represents uh, an involvement for those who are in the uh, the co-op management uh, industry if you will as well as those in the realtor industry and the transaction over a co-op purchase is a transaction that is different from other housing unit transactions this is not the same as buying a private house or buying a condo this is not the same as renting an apartment. The rules are different because you're actually not buying a unit, you're buying shares in a corporation that run a building. And then in, in return for those shares, you have a residential unit. So the rules that apply are different and the, uh, the concerns that have been expressed over the years require some negotiation because there are different interests that are at stake on both sides of that transaction. The intent of this law is to make the process go more smoothly and where possible to curb housing discrimination. And there, there are two basic elements within this bill. One is an element of timeliness, and the other is a, uh, uh, an element that involves information conveyed to make sure that there's a protection against prejudice. The, um, the nature of the timeliness is important for both the seller of the co-op and for the buyer of the co-op. Many times, anybody who's bought or sold, uh, in this case, shares for a unit, but for a residential proper, uh, preparation, there are a series of contingent realities. The person who is leaving is going to land someplace, most likely. The person who is buying is leaving someplace to land here, and there's a timely element to those things. In this particular case, the decision belongs to the co-op board of directors as to whether or not to accept an applicant for this. And what has been negotiated through this process is uh, two time frames that Within 15 days of a submitted completed application, the co-op board must acknowledge receipt of that application. And a completed application requires a lot of different uh, details, financial details primarily to be provided. And uh, oftentimes it's not, everything is not provided the first time around. They have to be specific information and it has to be uh, sufficient for the co-op board to make a full decision. And then within the submitted completion of the application, there are 60 days for which the co-op board can accept or reject the applicant, make the final decision. Now that timeliness factor matters a lot to the person who is waiting to find out if they're going to qualify and come in, but it's also a pressure on the co-op board because these are people who are volunteers, they live in the building, they have responsibilities in the management of the building, but uh, they don't do that as a primary responsibility. So putting time frames on it does create some parameters on both sides of the equation, and, and that is a critical element to make this process go through timely in a fashion. And uh, that was one of the things that the realtors were looking forward to see, that there's, there's an ability to know one way or the other, is this thing going to happen or not? The sellers of the unit and the buyers of the unit, or the shares, I should say, also need that timeliness. But at the same time, the timeliness has to work for the co-op board and for the management that's contracted to run the, uh, the entity. The second element of the law is to uh, hope to curb possible or actual housing discriminations. We have some very specific laws 
that say that you cannot uh, be prejudicial against a person based on their race, their creed, their gender, and so forth. Um, in, in the normal arrangements in a rental unit or in the buying or selling of a private home, uh, that nature of the, of the acceptance or the rejection looks a certain way. Within a co-op board acceptance or rejection, it might look differently because historically there's not been a reason given as to why a person would not qualify. More often than not, it's a financial obligation. And the other members of the co-op building have every right to make sure that the person that they're bringing in can handle their financial obligations because those obligations become contingent for everybody else in order for the, for the proper running of the building. But where there are non-economic reasons for rejection, uh, you know, uh, a person who's in public office like myself might get rejected because they don't want you in a building if uh, you're going to have people protesting you every day because of your public decisions out in front of the building. Maybe that's not what the rest of the co-op folks want. Uh, and that could be a reason as well for them to say, well, George, sorry, you're a nice guy, you don't get the unit. Whatever those decisions are, the public policy concern is that there not be a discriminatory reason for that. And in this law, what was negotiated is a protection that involves the Human Rights Commission to receive copies of all those rejections and that they would be looking to track any pattern of housing discrimination by a particular co-op board. If discrimination is found based on a pattern of behavior, then the Human Rights Commission has the authority and the responsibility to act, and they have uh, the ability to bring people together for testimony, and they can also issue sanctions along those lines. This law takes effect immediately. There's a sunset clause after three years, and uh, in, in a few minutes when I ask uh, Legislator Johnson and Vice Chair uh, Williams to uh, speak, they can talk a little bit more because they, they shepherded the legislative uh, actions uh, through the legislature. This bill, though, has a long history. Andre Stewart Cousins and Lois Brons were the first individuals to reference this legislation a long time ago, and they are also seen as the authors of the Human Rights Commission bill. Andrea's vision and Lois's heart that went into making that happen. I was part of that process, and, and I consider it one of the finest moments of my legislative career to be a part of that. Uh, in a different iteration, uh, Chairman of the Board Ken Jenkins and Majority Leader Pete Hockham uh, were advancing these issues. And then Ken and Alfreda Williams were part of the process to keep this issue alive. And then subsequent to that, Ken and Alfreda and Catherine Borgia, who isn't able to join us today, was a co-sponsor with Chris uh, and Alfreda of this legislation, uh, all helped make this happen. And, you know, sometimes in, in public office, when it takes a long time for something to happen, people lose heart. They believe it's never going to happen, that there's never going to be the right combination of things for this thing to happen. Obviously when, you have a, obviously, when you have a contentious issue, it's very difficult because people who otherwise, good people, fight very hard for a point of view. And this bill had very strong feelings on both sides of it. And uh, the, the concern to negotiate to settlement was a desire ultimately to take the vision that was expressed back with Andrea and Lois and Pete and Ken and get it done in some fashion. And so the flexibility to make this thing happen is a credit to the legislature. My role today is a very simple one to sign the bill into law. I want to particularly credit uh, Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins. He was critical in the discussions that helped uh, come about with a compromise. The success belongs to the Board of Legislators. But the role that the Deputy County Executive played in helping that happen was a critical role. And I believed, I've been at this podium now over the course of a year, I believe very strongly in crediting people when they do things right. It is not all just whatever happens in that corner office. It's the individuals of this government that achieve. When it's an achievement of the Board of Legislators, they should be the ones credited for it. <laughs> when it's an achievement by anybody on our staff, I've credited John Nona and Joan McDonald for various issues and negotiation. Uh, and in this particular case, Ken Jenkins played a, a pivotal role in bringing to fruition something that he himself envisioned over a long period of time. So I think perhaps if there is a message, it's we're grateful that we have a small-D democratic process where we can uh, argue, we can be heated, we can disagree, but we're also willing to engage long enough to try to come to some closure. And when we do get to closure, as we have today, that is a sign of the strength of the American system. Uh, across the party lines and across the different levels of government. So with that, I'm going to invite uh, first our senator-elect, Pete Harkham, to uh, share some of his thoughts, and then uh, we'll go through the remaining speakers. Senator Harkham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. It sounds great to say that as well. <laughs> and it's great to be back in the county office building uh, with some of my former colleagues and new colleagues. Um, I want to congratulate 
the Board of Legislators and the County Executive and the Deputy County Executive for getting this done. Uh, as County Executive mentioned, we worked on this when I was on the County Board for about four years, uh, both as Majority Leader and Chair of the Housing Committee, and we heard testimony a very vivid testimony that people would lose financing uh, because they had to wait so long for a decision from a particular board. Um, I, many of us have been in the situation where you get pre-approved for financing, but you have a short window in which to, uh, to close a deal. And so that was paramount. So the, the time limitation in this is, is critical, as is the piece uh, regarding <coughs> protected classes and whether there was a pattern of discrimination or not because boards don't have to give a reason and so that was another bit of troubling testimony that we heard and yet on on the other hand the the boards have a fiduciary responsibility to vet potential neighbors um, and to ensure that that they will come into this cooperative living situation uh, and be able to live uh, collaboratively and cooperatively with their neighbors. So this was a, a great compromise, I think. And, and once again, I want to congratulate all the parties uh, for negotiating in good faith. It was a long negotiation. Uh, I, I'm sorry I was not here to see the end of it, but so glad that uh, new legislators picked up the ball on this and got it over the line. And, and this is a fine piece of legislation, and uh, I want to congratulate everybody involved. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, he likes to uh, call himself a recovering legislator, which also applies to me as well. But our Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins, also a former chairman of the Board of Legislators, uh, involved in this issue for a long period of time and a critical reason why we were able to come to this closure. Ken? Um, firstly, this is a, a wonderful outcome and a, a good thing as County Executive Latimer, from his leadership and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table and has an opportunity to speak. It's not always just about having the number of votes to do something. It's always about making sure that everyone's voice is heard. And County Executive Vladimir's leadership in making sure there's transparent, open government is part of the reason that we're here today in a successful accomplishment in compromise and conversation. Um, I know that uh, as a, uh, as the county executive alluded to, um, we followed in large footsteps as County Executive Latimer, then Chairman of the Board of Legislators, um, with Lois Bronze, a former Chairwoman of the Board of Legislators, and uh, Andrea Stewart Cousins with the Human Rights Commission, and this being an outgrowth of that particular process. Um, when I come, came on the Board of Legislators, um, and that was one of my committees was housing, um, I was a real estate professional, so I knew from our real estate side, and, and certainly with Barry and Leah and, and certainly Richard um, Haggerty and the folks that are in the Board of Realtors, making sure that the co-op process um, from a realtor perspective, from a professional side, um, was less painful you know, for, for that particular process to make sure that people were getting in homes. But then on the other side, understanding as um, Senator um, Harkin was just referring to um, with the professionals that are in the Business Realty Institute and the professional management folks that represent the boards of the various boards around the co-ops and condominiums for Westchester County and being able to meet with them. I cannot tell you because how many times we have had meetings and not just the Board of Legislators meetings, meetings in co-ops and condos around the county for several years trying to get these things um, done and hearing everyone's concerns and trying to come to a, a balance that took care of the re realities of a process that um, it used to be you got the mortgage. Right? I remember that process when I first got a mortgage for a house, it was like, we got the mortgage, right? You know, and like, wow, we got the mortgage. <laughs> but now you had the additional um, portion of it with going through the board process. And whether you got through that or not was a, an additional challenge. So that was part of this conversation. But to have the opportunity and under the county executive's leadership to have everyone around the table to listen to the different concerns and then be able to work through it with my, my colleagues that were the former colleagues, and as the county executive says, I like to say recovering legislator because, um, you know, that gives you a different perspective. 
and that is evident in the things that have happened over the course of this administration over this year, that the county executive's leadership in making sure that you listen to people because you always, as a legislator, need other folks to work with you. You can't just do that alone. As county executive, certainly uh, the county executive can just say, this is how we're going and this is how we're going to move forward. But as a legislator, you always want to make sure to hear everyone's voice. So that is the accomplishment that happened today. That this was a result, again, of conversations back and forth, listening to everyone, and quite frankly, having a time frame to get to the results. Um, some good friends of mine in the, the, um, the real estate world said, you know what, one of the arguments about this all along was, well, we have all this great process around. Um, well, people don't take advantage of it. If someone's looking for a home and they get rejected, they go, I got to move on. This particular law does not stop those individuals that feel that they've been discriminated against from going through that process, as our friends in, in management and the real estate world all understand. Those laws exist, and they're going to continue to exist, and people could take advantage of this. But in addition to that, you have another process where you can see patterns and things developing where education can happen, because it's not about the penalties. It's really about education because I don't think there's anyone, and that was why this was such a great accomplishment at the end of the day, whether it was someone that was managing the co-ops on the board process, the realtors or individuals themselves, they all want to get this thing done as far as getting involved in housing and safe and affordable housing for themselves. So I think that this was great. It's fantastic. It's a great opportunity. And again, it shows the kind of things that work when you listen to everyone. And yet it takes a little bit of time. And I know that a lot of times people look around and they say, things don't move quickly. Well, good things take time. And this is a great example of that. So congratulations to my, my friends down on the eighth floor, my legislator, Le Legislator Johnson being the co-sponsor of this uh, prime sponsor of the legislation, um, but all of the, my friends down there for listening to all of the individuals. But again, I want to make sure that we don't forget that this took a lot of work, not just by the legislative branch and listening to folks, but by the, the co-op um, professionals Right, the management team, you know, Al and Ken, and Ken, we, uh, we've listened to so many things that are going on. But again, the Board of Realtors and being steadfast in trying to make sure they're protecting the rights of everyone that's getting involved. So congratulations to all, and I'm looking forward to this signing. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, and since the cat is a bit out of the bag, I might as well officially introduce uh, representatives of those organizations now. Uh, the BRI uh, and the, uh, the uh, Associated Co-op Council is represented here by the leader of that group, Alan Unziata, and with him, uh, Carl Finger, Carl, Kathy, Ken Finger, all with us here uh, on behalf of uh, the co-op management industry, and we appreciate your professionalism, your role in all of this. From the uh, realty, uh, realtor industry, the Hudson Gateway uh, realtors, we have Rich Haggerty, Leah Caro, Barry Kramer, just outgoing as president, uh, unless he's still president for another hour or two. <laughs> has, has, has the hammer gone down yet? And, and other members as well of the realty industry who are all represented here. And we appreciate your involvement, not just in this issue, but in all the advocacy you do issue after issue. Uh, next, I'm going to call on our vice chair of the Board of Legislators, Alfreda Williams. Thank you. Well, good morning. I am delighted to have been a co-sponsor of this legislation. It's been quite a while in coming. Uh, the investment in real estate, whether it's at the co-op level or the single family home or the multiple, multiple family home, is a major step for most families and most individuals. So to be able to know in advance what's going to happen is important. And as um, Mr. Jenkins said, when you get a mortgage, you know, you go to the bank and you apply and you fill out all this paperwork and they ask you, you know, to uh, mortgage your, your firstborn and what have you. <laughs> and going back, you know, to your credit when you were in high school or college or what have you. So here we are, most people, feel that they have reached 
a, a limit or a level where they can say, well, I'm financially solvent and I'm going to do this and I have so much money to put down and I know I'll be able to do this. And then you come to a board and you turn down and you're never given a reason and the whole thing takes maybe six months or more. So the advent of this legislation, the passing of it, makes it possible for people to know. It establishes a time limit, which is terribly important because most of the banks give you a time limit. So at least you now know within 15 days for the application, 60, 60 days later on, that you were going to get some kind of definitive word. When you turned down in the past, there was no, there was no other avenue to approach this. But now we do have the Human Rights Commission who will be involved in this. And this is a good thing. And I think all sides, the real estate industry, the co-op owners, all of us know that this was a long time coming but it's long overdue and it's something that makes it possible <laughs> for everyone to feel that uh, they have a stake in the game, they have a representation and they're not being ignored or they're not losing money unnecessarily and they don't know what happened. So I am, as I say, I'm proud to be a co-sponsor with this. I think that this will go a long way in making people feel more prospective co-op owners more comfortable about what happens to their hard-earned dollars and how they're looked at by possible neighbors. And uh, it makes it possible for us to say and believe that uh, any possible discrimination is being addressed. My predecessors, Lois Bronze and Andrea Stewart Cousins, went a long way in making legislation possible for establishing legislation to make it possible for people to get fair treatment in this county. And this legislation furthers that effort. So again, I'm delighted. And I want to introduce my colleague, Christopher Johnson from Yonkers. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'd like to first thank um, all of my past colleagues and my current colleagues who've had a hand in this. Um, it was seven prime sponsors, I think, that uh, the county executive mentioned. And in this time, we know that seven is the number of completion. And so we're here today to celebrate the completion of, of an issue that we know has taken a long time. One of those uh, sponsors is uh, Senator-elect Pete Harcum. We are wearing the same tie. So if you can't tell the difference between the two of us, he's got glasses and I've got a beard. He, he's the handsome one. <laughs> um, but truly, uh, this is a long time coming. And what doesn't need to take that long is for a person to have an opportunity to find a new place to live. And so making sure that that process runs smoothly um, was at the core of this bill. This legislation says that uh, you found a place that you love, you found a place that you like. Uh, the bank says you can do that, that you have the means, the ability to move forward. And so let's get that process rolling. Let's move that ball down the hill. Uh, and the second part of this, though, is really important to me, uh, where we feel that there were several people who understood that uh, housing discrimination is real. Right? It's real in single family homes, it's real in apartment buildings, it's real in all types of purchases. Uh, and so there needs, work needs to be done to make sure that that doesn't exist. And so uh, there were some advocates on the other side who said that we don't have that issue. Uh, that most of this work that we do when individuals get rejected, it is financial. And so they came and they testified and um, I think the good thing about the supermajority that I work with on the eighth floor is that we have a lot of great ideas, but we don't just want to ram them through. That we are thoughtful and we are careful, and there is a real desire to listen to both sides of the argument, because just because I disagree with you doesn't mean you didn't say something that makes sense. And so uh, 
having the Human Rights Commission involved uh, and say, look, we will take a look and, and make sure that discrimination was not involved in this rejection, uh, that we will take a look and see if there's a pattern uh, of, of bad practice here, that that was helpful in making sure that we crafted something that everyone could agree to, that all people could, um, could understand that, uh, the desire of what we wanted to get done, that we wanted to make sure that the process worked smoothly and that there was fairness in the process, that individuals were not cast out because of the color of their skin or because of their gender or because of their sexual orientation or their religion or a number of other issues where people oftentimes uh, truly in the nation we live in unfortunately still get left out. And so we wanted to make sure that that was not a reality um, in co-op purchases. And so we look forward to making sure that uh, People have an opportunity to live in housing that they that they see uh, fit for them. That the bank and the mortgage that the banks uh, feel that they can financially afford, and that their future neighbors uh, will be excited to to welcome them into uh, their community. So once again, I want to thank all of my colleagues in government, the county executive, for uh, bringing us here together and inviting uh, past. Um, sponsors of the bill so that we can all celebrate together, uh, those who have been advocates on, on all sides to make sure that we can uh, have this moment together where we understand that we did something good for the people of Westchester <coughs> County. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. The, um, uh, the bill is down here somewhere. There it is. <clears throat> which I'll sign into law. Just um, one other, two other final quick comments before we do this and then go to questions. We have, um, uh, you know, a, a dialogue that's going on in our uh, community about uh, the level of activity that this Board of Legislators and this administration have had. And I've heard some people say, well, that's it's a lot of social activism and so forth. But I think the story today is the real story. It's a story of pragmatism. It's, it's the story of seeing a need that has to be addressed. Damon Marr represents Garth Road, which has a, a large number of co-op buildings on it. David Tubiella represents Bronx River Road, which has a large corridor of co-ops on it. And there's, there's an issue, and the issue has to be addressed. And the question is, how do you address it responsibly? How do you make sure the people are at the table that are, that are affected by it? And how do you find a place to get to? Not everybody's 100% happy about compromise, but uh, you get to a place that you can live with. That's really the story of this Board of Legislators, and uh, certainly as I've interacted with the Board and my responsibilities as we've made legislative suggestions to the Board and as they have developed suggestions on their own, I think it is a, it is a triumph of pragmatism over ideology, and I'm very proud to be able to sign this into law as an outgrowth of that. This is Local Law Introduction 10626 of 2018. It was passed by the Board of Legislators by a vote of 13 in favor and 4 against on the 19th of November. And on this, the 14th day of December? Yes. Of 2018, my uh, signature as county executive has uh, made this a local law. So well, let's open it up to any questions from the press. And uh, if uh, any of uh, my legislative colleagues who've recently spoke want to handle any of these questions as well, you're welcome to come up to the microphone depending on uh, how it's asked. Any questions from our friends in the media? Just to be clear, um, the co-op boards now have, they have 60 days deadline to accept or reject an application after it's deemed complete? That's right. The, the, the completion of the application, uh, which has a 15-day window, once that clock starts ticking, it's a 60-day period for acceptance or rejection. And that 60-day period begins with the acceptance of the completion of the application and that that window is satisfied. And the co-op board is the one that says it's completed. Right. And the co-op board receives the material and they, they're the ones that certify that it's complete based on whatever their application is. John? Is there a penalty if they do not, uh, if they pass that 60-day window? It's 2,500. Okay, good. Uh, the, the, the penalty for not turning those um, things in is $2,500. So it's it's twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred dollars, no matter for what the term is, or day, or what. The, it's a it's a significant penalty because again, the poor, the co op board, the way that the law is structured, mm -hmm. um, is the one that determines the 
the completeness of the original application. So once the board says it's complete, then the clock starts. Right? <coughs> you know, I'm going to ask uh, Chris and Alfred yeah. if you'd like to come up here because some of these questions will relate to the legislative discussion and process, and you should be the ones to answer uh, as you have experienced it. Did you want to follow up, John? Yeah, yeah one other question. Uh, Westchester now follows, I think, Rockland County and Suffolk County, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, Rockland County earlier this year, I think it was earlier this year, passed, passed a similar co-op transparency bill that also was a compromise that doesn't have the uh, reason for rejection included in that. Uh, that prompted County Executive Day to criticize the bill stating that it lost some of its teeth. Could some, uh, I, I know it's a compromise between both the building and, and the realtor industry, but do you think that without that uh, reason for rejection, that maybe some of the teeth of this bill is lost? And, I, and sort of, it, it's a three year sunset on this. Right. Is there a possibility that this law will either be strengthened or felt that there's no need and can be well, from, from an executive standpoint, I signed the bill into law with no uh, uh, regrets uh, about what, what's happened. This is a process of negotiation. Each side in this would have preferred something a bit different than what the final product is. And of course, they're right to advocate for what they think is right. Uh, I, th I think two things apply. First of all, the fact that there is a sunset means that it will have to be reauthorized in time, which means you'll have a chance to look and see how it functioned. How many rejections went before the HRC and, and what did the HRC do with them? And it will have a real track record of reality, not just a, you know, a, a projection of what might be the case. And I think uh, the legislature of that day, the executive of that day, uh, will make a determination if there needs to be a modification or not based on the real world terms. So I, rather than anticipating that this will uh, be weakened, I think we now operate under these rules and we see how it works. And I think that's a prudent way to proceed. The fact that there's a sunset gives you an automatic uh, check. Now, if you didn't have a sunset, you could still review the results at any point in time and legislate at any point in time, but a built-in sunset requires uh, that, that rediscussion when it comes time for reauthorization and whatever the public hearing process there is, committee process will all trigger at that time. So I wouldn't anticipate that it won't work, but we'll watch, we'll see, and we'll make some observations. And I think, as I've said, the industry representatives on both sides of this issue are going to watch this very closely to see how it affects the clients that they represent. And uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, if, if something is not working properly, we'll know about it in due time. But I don't, I don't sign this with any regret or any uh, ex uh, expectation that it's less than a, a good thing to do. So another hand up, Michelle? So I'm sorry. Okay. Michelle, and then we'll go forward. Okay, go ahead. Just to be clear, um, the new law requires a co-op board to notify the Western Society Human Rights Commission when, when an application is rejected, but um, they don't have to tell them why it was rejected. Right? That's right. There's no, there's no, requ there's no requirement uh, to explain what the basis of the rejection was. But rejections ought to be sent to the HRC, and the HRC, through their process, will make a determination if a further investigation is needed or not. And then obviously the person who's been rejected uh, can certainly then follow up directly if they feel that they have been uh, prejudiced against in some fashion, for whatever reason they think it is, in one of the, uh, the classes that, that we try to um, uh, avoid, uh, you know, projection in, uh, protection for, then I think they'll have that opportunity because it'll go before the HRC in a formal fashion. And the HRC has teeth to it. It, it has the ability to uh, do certain things that would, uh, you know, uh, represent a sanction if there was, uh, if there was uh, definable uh, prejudice. Yes. You had a question, ma'am? Yes. Could you explain how the law is going to be enforced if the board did not report to their rejection? How do you know? Chris, since you negotiated much of this, why don't you answer that one? <coughs> want to restate the question for uh, Legislative Please. Johnson? Yes. So I'd like to know, uh, would you explain how the law is going to be enforced if there is no report coming from the board? How do the county know that they are not going to so, uh, luckily, there are a lot of people involved in, in real estate tra transactions. So, you have realtors, you have uh, the co-op board themselves, and so when someone is being represented uh, and they get a rejection notice, um, it's to be sent to the Human Rights Commission simultaneously, and if that doesn't occur, uh, their representation will make sure that that happens as well and that that is communicated. Um, there was an earlier question about the penalty as well that I just wanted to address. 
we want to make sure that people have an opportunity to um, access housing. And so if the, the, the date is 60 days, but if on 62 days uh, you are accepted in, uh, that's a good thing still. And so we're not looking to penalize people on a day or two, but the reality is we want to make sure that this process moves forward and that people do have the opportunity to access housing. What Tacoma and the county will be enforcing? Uh, the, human the Human Rights, rights Commission. Rights the Human Rights, 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 rights Commission. Rights 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 right. Correct. Uh, other questions for uh, any of our individual guests or generically? Yeah, I'd like to ask, uh, Mr. Johnson, I'm a, a vice president of co-op in Hartsdale. It's my understanding there's a first-time fee of 1000 a second-time fee, it goes to 1500 I think there's two steps. It's two steps. It's a thousand for the first fine and fifteen for the second. There, consequently. Absolutely. Can you clarify what happens at the end of the sixty days? Because I think that's what the original question was. I don't think there's any penalty at that time. Well, at the end of the 60 days, either there's an acceptance or there's a rejection. Uh, um, and if, if there's a rejection that's sent to the Human Rights uh, Commission, and if there's an acceptance, then yay, you're welcome into the community. If nothing happens, then at that point, uh, there'll be communication with, uh, the human right, with the Human Rights Commission in the county, and the fine will be levied. And the fine is 2500 or 1000 It's 1000 a It's a scale. It's a scale. Oh, so it's, that, so it's not 2500 It's that Sorry. scale. Correct. In 2000. Yes. I have a question. Why don't we take the questions uh, after the okay. media? Because the media probably probably on deadlines. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If you don't Thank mind, you. any media questions, and then we'll deal with every any other questions. <laughs>